Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining UVM's Continuing in Distance Education, our discussion on careers in public health and UVM's Master of Public Health program. We're so happy to have you with us today. We have a full agenda, lots to talk about, and we hope to get to your questions as well. Just a few logistics for the folks joining us on YouTube today. Um, I just put a hello in the chat box and um, requesting any questions to be placed in the chat box. We will um, copy those questions over and share them with our presenters today as well. And throughout the presentation, if there are questions that we don't get to, we will do our best to answer those. And Kelly on our team will also put up our email address throughout the presentation. So I wanted to share with you um, a few things that we're going to go over today. We'll do quick introductions, and then we're going to talk about what is UVM's Master of Public Health program and what is unique to UVM's program as well. Um, public health issues and public health crisis in America, there are a variety, and it's really interesting to consider the depths and the breadth of some of the public health issues that we are facing in our country. We're going to dive deeper into two areas of public health, epidemiology and global health. And we're also going to talk about career opportunities in those specific areas, but broader career opportunities as you could consider a career in public health as well. And we also have our advisor who works very closely with our Master of Public Health students. And she will share with us some of the questions that students ask and that process to consider joining the Master of Public Health program as well. So thank you so much for being with us. My name is Nicola Willie I. Fenton. I have the pleasure of working at UVM's Continuing and Distance Education Department. So joining us today is Dr. Vicki Hart. She is one of our assistant professors at Larner College of Medicine, and she focuses her attention in epidemiology and biostatistics. We're going to hear from Dr. Hart today. Vicki, thank you for joining us today. We also have Dr. Kelsey Gleason. Dr. Kelsey Gleason is an assistant professor of medicine in our public health programs in the Larner College of Medicine as well. And she focuses her area of expertise in environmental epidemiology, global health, and humanitarian disaster resilience and response. Dr. Gleason, we're so happy that you are able to join us today. And also with us on our team from CDE, Continuing Distance Education, is Vika Pleshakova. She is our student services professional. She works so closely with our Master of Public Health students and has been advising students for more than 10 years. And we're really thankful that Vika is able to join us and share the perspective of what the experience is like for our students. So I'm going to dive right in. And we're going to toss over to Dr. Hart first. I'd like to just do a quick overview for folks that maybe aren't familiar with UVM's Master of Public Health program. Um, Vicki, can you just walk us through some of the information? What is unique, and, and what are some of the program benefits of UVM's Master of Public Health program? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I think the, the first and the biggest thing is to note we're a fully online program. Um, so everything is, is taken care of online. And we're a generalist program. So what that means to us is that our students graduate with a broad idea of what public health is. There's certainly the opportunity to take some deeper dives into different um, avenues of public health because it is so broad. But you can see in the graph here that it's a hugely interdisciplinary field. So everything from statistics to environmental health to health policy, which has been so important in addressing some of the current issues in public health. We really try to give our students a, a general uh, understanding of public health and where they could go with this degree through our core courses. And then there's some elective opportunities, too, for students to dive into things that are of particular interest to them as well. A few things that, um, oh, if you could just go back for a second, I just want to touch on our culminating project experience, where students have the opportunity to work with some public health data, form a research hypothesis, and really get into analysis. And also in our applied um, practical experience, and students work in their communities in public health to get some practical experience and understand like, what is it like to work in public health you know, in this field that I think I might be interested in. You can go ahead. So yeah, so the areas of excellence that we talk about, so within the program and also within those elective credits, students have the opportunity to, to dive into one of these if there's a particular interest in global health or in um, health policy students have the opportunity to take some, some elective credits there. Or to say, I kind of want to sample and see what I might be interested in. And they can choose their electives from multiple areas of excellence within the program. 
I also wanted to just then touch on some of the um, public health crisis and issues in the United States. Um, and Dr. Gleason, you and I, we were talking um, extensively about some of the issues that are facing um, Americans and are, are, are really public health issues. Do you want to just talk us through, and we've got a couple different slides that touch on some of these issues that are very topical and mindful for you as a team at the, at the public health program. Great, thanks, Nicole. And I think that you're spot on. You know, when we when we think of public health, we we often think of communicable diseases like COVID-19, or we think of non-communicable diseases like diabetes. But there are many structural and societal determinants of health, such as racism, and we're seeing that a lot in the news nowadays. Um, and and at its core, racism is a public health issue. Racism is something that we refer to as a social determinant of health, and a social determinant is a condition in which we are born and where we live, work, and play. It's where we spend our time. So a social determinant like racism is a key driver of health inequities. So for example, racism is highly linked to chronic stress. Chronic stress caused by discrimination can trigger all sorts of things and cause a cascade of adverse health outcomes. And racism, which can be both intentional or unintentional, affects the health and well-being of individuals and communities, and it, and it really stifles progress. And I just want to reiterate that it is a, a public health crisis, and it's not one that we often think about when we hear the term public health, but it, it is a public health crisis. We also have other kinds of public health crises that we don't quite think about a lot. You know, everyone, I think most people know nowadays that cigarettes are bad for your health. Um, but now up and coming as we make progress with reducing the amounts of uh, cigarette smoke in our communities, we're seeing an increase in the number of vaping and e-cigarette use in public. And that's also a public health issue. Uh, there's other public health issues like gun violence in America. We don't often think about that one either, but gun violence is not only tied to things like mental health issues, but it's tied to all sorts of other adverse public health outcomes. And the next slide shows that affordable health care is a real public health issue. And affordable health care has a cascading effect as well when we think about access to health care. Um, in marginalized communities and um, other social determinants of health that allow or inhibit access to health care. And, and thank you so much for pointing that out. I think it's really important for all of us to understand that these issues, back to your point, while you may see these things happening in our community, we might not think of them as public health issues, but they indeed are. And I just really appreciate you bringing that perspective and also um, recognizing that the team uh, at the Master of the Public Health Program at Larner College of Medicine and the Continuing Distance Education and Greater UVM is exploring ways as to how we as an as a educational institution help to bring these issues, not just racism, but gun violence and, and various different other public health issues um, to the forefront so that we can increase the education of our community members as well. So in particular, as racism is a public health crisis, there are work being done behind the scenes for um, all of the teams here at UVM to increase the opportunities for education, um, reviewing of curriculum and policies um, so that we can continue this conversation in a constructive and productive way. Um, I wanted to come back to Dr. Hart um, because epidemiology is um, at the core of what you do and love. Um, and I think that uh, disease detectives probably are some of the most high profile careers at the moment um, because of the pandemic. Uh, and so could you just walk us through what is epidemiology? And then we have a few slides as to what do epidemiologists do? For sure, yeah. So I feel like the, the country and the world in general has had a crash course in epidemiology over the last several months. So. Epidemiology is really concerned with the cause and spread of disease. And I've been putting together my, my epi class for the, the second half of the summer, and really coronavirus has offered such a rich source of examples of what epidemiologists do and how epidemiologists affect public health and public health policy. So in an outbreak situation like this, epidemiologists were really at the forefront of understanding where is the disease in the population and what can we do to 
put our arms around the outbreak, so to prevent the disease from spreading further and containing the disease where it's at through contact tracing, um, through social distancing. So epidemiologists have really been at the core of our response to coronavirus, and that's what we do with, with every kind of outbreak. This is on a pandemic scale, but there's many outbreaks happening all over the country and all over the world, and epidemiologists are really a part of that. Epidemiologists also um, think about, you know, if we put infectious disease and coronavirus aside, epidemiologists are also looking at like things like chronic diseases, which are a real problem in our community, cancer, um, heart disease, respiratory disease, and trying to figure out what are the risk factors that are associated with those diseases, and also where do those risk factors live? And this is where we get back into some of those social determinants and some of the issues that, that Kelsey was talking about with, you know, epidemiology can really help us from a data-driven standpoint be those disease detectives and understand where, where are these risk factors happening, what populations are being hit hardest by disease, and what can we do to offer data around that in order to be able to influence policy, uh, can educate our communities, and um, educate our clinical science as well. So I think a thing that, something that gets a little bit lost in epidemiology is just how scientific it is and how we're using very rigorous and very structured methods in order to be able to draw really good, solid, rigorous conclusions from the public health data. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hart. And so then we'll toss over to back to Dr. Gleason as well, because you kind of cross over environmental epidemiology and global health. And so walk us through, um, in terms of public health, what is global health? Right. Thanks, Nicole. And you're, you're absolutely right. I, in my personal work, I cross the bridge between epidemiology, environmental health, global health. And as you'll see throughout this presentation, these topics are really interconnected. And so global health is the specific study of improving the health and achieving equity in people worldwide. So this is not on a local community scale, but on a global scale. And uh, global health is mostly focused on marginalized or vulnerable communities in the international sphere. But within global health, there's different sectors as well. So um, within global health, you can work on areas of healthcare access. So that's improving healthcare for people like refugees or other displaced persons. There's humanitarian assistance. So when a disaster strikes, either conflict or natural, uh, global health practitioners with a public health background are needed to mitigate the effects of those disasters. Many people in global public health work on maternal and child health to reduce the number of mortalities and infant deaths throughout the world. Also disaster risk reduction. We know that natural disasters are going to happen. We know that conflicts are going to happen. How can we as public health practitioners work to mitigate the effects of those disasters? And finally, there's international development. How can we promote societies to allow for increased health access? How can we give people access to education? How can we promote the well-being and increase the economies in global communities? And so, like I said, it's all connected. In my work in global health, I could never do it without a foundation in epidemiology. And that's where our strong interdisciplinary foundational approach with our MPH program comes in. Global Health uses epidemiological tools and public health foundational knowledge in practice. In my day-to-day -day work in Global Health, I develop surveys and use quantitative and qualitative methods. I analyze them using biostatistics and epidemiological tools in order to come up with the best solutions to help these international communities. One of the things, too, that I think is so wonderful about our program is the opportunity to not only work with Vika as they're considering coming in and, and, and exploring what you both have been talking about is, you know, do, am I more interested in epi? Am I more interested in global health? How do those connect? Um, Vika walks students through the opportunities. And then on the other side, and I, and I would love Vika to talk about this as well, is there's career coaching and advising that students have throughout the program and as alumni. Vika, can you just walk us through what are some of the unique services kind of in the beginning as people are thinking about the program all the way to as they're alumni of the program as well? Sure. So one of the unique uh, parts of this program is that we offer personalized advising uh, and career coaching. 
So you will be meeting with me before you start your coursework and you will be meeting with our career coach uh, throughout your orientation. We also offer orientation for the students who are studying a couple of weeks before the classes begin, so that gives you um, a taste of what the courses are going to be like, gets you more comfortable in an online environment, gets you a chance to meet and introduce yourself to the rest of the cohort, and make those connections before you jump into the courses. And then we work with you on your course planning, your um, however many years you're going to spend in the program, be it 15 months or five years, if you're um, employed full time and you have other commitments. And then we also help you determine when you're going to graduate and what you need for that. And the program is very flexible. If you decide you're not able to graduate in two years, then we can change your course of action and um, help you out that way. As part of the career coaching, um, you will be working with Heather, who is helping students with their interviewing skills, resume writing, cover letter writing, um, and also creating your LinkedIn or LinkedIn profile or electronic portfolio and connecting you with a vast network of our current public health students or public health alumni. And also you will be assigned a faculty advisor who can help you with determine, determining your career or if you're interested in specific concentration, whether it's quantitative aspect like epidemiology, biostatistics, or global health, um, then you will be working with either Dr. Hart or Dr. Gleason. Um, and as far as the advising goes, like I said, it's personalized and it happens entirely online. It's up to you how you would like to meet with me. We can have phone appointments. We can have Zoom, Skype um, meetings online. Everything happens in, in the virtual space. And I know you get this question a lot as people are considering the program. What can I do with a Master of Public Health? Um, and this slide is not inclusive of everything. I, I certainly know that. But, but do you get that question often? And, and what usually is your response, Vika? Um, well, the beauty of it being the multidisciplinary generalist program is that you can take our MPH in any field you would like, whether you're a career changer or you're just changing the jobs within the department that you're working on already, we can help you apply your skills and the knowledge that you've gained throughout the MPH to best apply them. And that's where our career coach comes in and helps you um, determine your best interests. And also, as part of this MPH, you can really hone in, as Dr. Hart said, on the specific concentration or area, be it the quantitative like if you acknowledge in biostatistics or global environmental health, or if you're interested in um, healthcare policy management and advocacy, we can help you choose your elective courses so that you can focus on one area. And also connecting, connecting MPH students to the alumni so they can, for example, if it's all, it's all online, of course, but we can help you connect with somebody from your home state or even hometown so that you can um, you can make those connections and ask the questions from the students and gain from their experiences as well. Thank you, Vika, so much for that. And we're going to get into a little bit more um, career opportunities in the specific areas of epi and global health. But Vika, also wondering, um, because I know that um, you mentioned the time frame that people can uh, finish the program. And is it most often, folks that are still working um, full-time, part-time, and trying to complete the program, and what does that look like in terms of their course load? Sure. So for the students who work full-time, I would say two courses per semester seems to be fairly, fairly manageable. Um, and then students can also take one course at a time in the summer. Summer courses are intensive. They're only six weeks long. But if you can, if you can take one course at a time, um, that would be advisable, not, not two or three. Certainly. You have maximum of five years to graduate, so we can cater the courses and schedule each semester so that you are able to not only focus on your career, family, other um, obligations, and be successful in the courses as well. Um, and we have about, I would say, about 75% of our students who work full time, and the, the financial aid is available, so that's another, another draw. And right now, as students, some of the students whose work hours may have been cut down or they lost their jobs, they choose the field of public health because they know they can find employment after they graduate. And like I said, financially, through federal loans is available. 
point. Yeah, thank you for sharing that perspective. I appreciate that. Dr. Hart, I want to come back to you because, um, as you mentioned earlier, epidemiology has been in the spotlight um, due to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and while just you know detecting how the disease started and spread is certainly um, probably the sexier job of epidemiologists, um, but what are some other things that folks can do if this is an area that they're um, interested in? Sure, yeah, thanks, Nicole. Um, so there's, there's a multitude of, of things that epidemiologists can do, and I feel like students in and graduating from the program at the moment are in a whole different world when it comes to careers in epidemiology. Certainly for the first time in my career when I say I'm an epidemiologist or interested in epidemiology, people actually know what I'm talking about. So it's a really, it's a really great time to, to be in this field and in public health. Um, so epidemiologists, like I said before, in, in an outbreak situation, um, certainly involved in contact tracing and some of those immediate activities, but also as you can see on the slide here, there's a number of different ways in which people can apply epidemiology. Because it really is a system of methods, those methods can be applied to research, to public practice, to public health interventions, um, to overseeing public health programs, so it's a very broad um, array of things that people can do as epidemiologists. One thing that I think is going to be really Im an important role of epidemiologists going forward as we come out of this outbreak is understanding or being able to, to provide data-driven and evidence-based uh, information about how we need to change our policies and um, how different groups of people or ages of people are affected by disease and what that means for us on a policy basis. So epidemiologists can really play a big role in providing those, those data and those data-driven, evidence-based kind of information to our, um, to our policymakers in order to make the best healthcare policy that we can. Um, I also want to give a shout out to research in epidemiology and research in public health in general, that epidemiologists are a huge part of that along with biostatisticians, um, again, to provide data-driven information that we can use then to create public health interventions and, and go forward. Great. Thank you very much for that perspective and diving a little bit deeper. And Dr. Gleason, we're going to come back to you because um, folks might also be interested in global health and it seems a very broad term. And so what are some different opportunities that uh, folks could go into in this particular field? Right. Thank you, Nicole. And as Dr. Hart mentioned, there are so many different directions that you can take a career in epidemiology and global health and in public health in general. And this is just to name a few. I think one of the most important things to note about public health is there's no one-size-fits-all approach. There are so many different career opportunities within the public health sphere and within the global health sphere as well. One of the things about working in global health is typically, though again, not always, typically there is some sort of international component. Uh, you can either be based internationally or you can be based in the United States and have occasional travel overseas. Um, generally, the travel is one of the perks. So if you're interested in global health, uh, that might be something that would, would draw you in. Um, the different career opportunities are things like research think tanks. So you could work for a for-profit institution that is contracted to provide uh, research and information for different non-governmental or governmental organizations. You can also do consulting. This is also a for-profit option. Um, and by for-profit, I mean that you will probably make more money in those two fields than you would if you worked for a non-governmental organization or an NGO. Uh, you could also work in academia. So as Dr. Hart mentioned, this is the research part of things. So a huge part of our jobs in academia is to actually not only do teaching, but also do research to support the evidence base in the field of public health. There's a lot of global health work within the U.S. government. The government is really interested to learn how best to help other countries. Uh, and also the United Nations, so internationally based, but also you could be based here in the United States. One that people often don't think about is the military. The United States military does a lot of work with global health, a lot of international development work, and a lot of conflict resolution work. And as I mentioned earlier, you could also work for a non-governmental organization. These are organizations like UNICEF, Save the Children, Doctors Without Borders, um, many, many different types of NGOs work in the global health sphere. 
Dr. Gleason, do you envision or are you experiencing that not, not necessarily the careers, but maybe the opportunities in global health of some of these organizations may be a little bit different right now or in the near future because of the pandemic and because travel restrictions and just because the world has shifted so much in the last few months? Absolutely. And even in my own personal work, a lot of what we do has shifted from traveling into the field and actually doing field-based research or working with practitioners in the field to, okay, let's develop technologies that will allow us to still work internationally without spawning some sort of disaster like what happened in the 2010 earthquake response in Haiti where humanitarian responders with all good intentions brought cholera into that global arena. And so as global health practitioners, we need to be really careful to not make the same mistakes that we've made in the past. And so absolutely, Nicole, we're moving towards a more technology-driven online-based approach, which is thankfully made more possible with the connectivity through the internet. Interesting, but maybe there's missing that um, human connection that I know we all um, have been missing in general, you know, over the last couple of months. Um, and speaking of that human connection, Vika, I'm going to come back to you um, because these are some of the most common questions. And I know we touched on them a little bit, but maybe go back through because um, maybe some of our folks listening on YouTube didn't quite catch the time frame that people can um, complete the program. Um, could you just walk us through because I know these are the questions that most commonly get asked. Sure. So this the program usually uh, takes from any any time from 15 months to five years to complete. You have five years maximum to graduate with your MPH, and if you start in the summer, it's possible for you to do four semesters: summer, fall, spring, and summer, and complete your coursework as fast as possible. Most of the students, I would say, complete the program within two to three years, just because they have. Um, family and job obligations, and they're not able to do a full-time MPH. The tuition is differentiated, which means our online out-of-state students are paying a different tuition than regular out-of-state students. So right now it's $970 per credit for out-of-state students and $627 per credit for in-state students. And financial aid is available. Um, is you will need to talk to the Student Financial Services and fill out the the federal application form for financial aid, but as far as I know, most of the students get Stafford loans for the program. The online courses work uh, in asynchronously, which means you do work in your own time. And if Dr. Hart and Dr. Gleason, you have anything to add, please jump in. The students complete modules on a weekly basis. Um, so the courses require a lot of self-discipline, focus, and great organizational skills. Um, and we would help you with those as well. We can connect you with resources if you need help with time management or uh, organizing your, your days. And you will have to complete the work on your own time, but of course you will have deadlines for projects, assignments, and tests. As we mentioned before, there is no concentration within our MPH. We are um, generalist program, but you can create your own mini concentration by focusing your electives, which you will need three electives in a certain area. So that, that way you can um, hone in on the specific area within the public health that you're interested in. Um, right now, we don't have any internships, and of course with the pandemic, things have changed. Um, and we do help connect students with the local air, with the local nonprofit organizations or um, communities that may accept students to do some um, work or community service for them. And also as part of your MPH, you will have to complete an applied practice experience, which will require you um, to complete at least 20 hours in the field of public health. I, I think you make a great point too, Vika. And maybe I'll just toss over to Dr. Hart for a moment. Can you walk us through what is an online course in our MPH um, program, not in terms of the subject, but what does it look like and, and the kind of routine that folks get into and what can they expect to find um, in terms of the lectures and the style in our courses? Yeah, absolutely. And it does vary a little bit course by course, but we really do have um, a structure, as Vika said, that's an asynchronous online course structure. 
So that means that there are no particular times when a course will meet, so you don't have to be at your computer at any certain time, and there's no live sessions, which gives students, especially those students who have families and are working, the opportunity to be in the material and to be working in the material on their schedule. Um, this doesn't mean that we don't have opportunities to connect during the course or that you're alone behind your computer not connecting with anybody during the, the course of your study. Um, we do build in a lot of different things, um, either videos, discussions, opportunities for, um, for you know, guest speakers, things like that, in order to keep the connection, to keep you connected to your public health peers, and to keep the courses interesting because it is you know, more difficult. There's a lot of self-motivation involved, and we do recognize that and try to cater our courses to that. So most courses each week, you'll have a full week to complete the work. Um, and there are deadlines each week or each module, depending on sort of the structure of the class, so that you are having to keep up with the material throughout the semester. Um, and you don't have that opportunity to, to fall way behind. So we, you know, we help you with that time management and, and catching any issues really early. And then each module has a collection of lectures, maybe some readings, um, those assignments, and maybe a discussion assignment, or the opportunity to connect with your peers over the learning material as well. Great. Thank you for that overview. I really appreciate that. That was a great point to raise it too, Vika. Um, Vika, I'm going to come back to you. So what do people need to do um, to consider to apply for the program? Sure. So what we're looking for is the basic understanding of science and math or statistics, because you will be taking highly quantitative courses like epidemiology 1 and 2 and biostatistics. So we want to make sure that you're coming in with a set of skills that will help you throughout the program. Having said that, we also won't turn you away if you are missing a course um, in math or statistics from your college work. We will guide you and advise you the best we can so that you are prepared, whether it's taking a course at a community college before you come or completing, um, um, getting admitted on condition and then completing a quantitative course with a passing with a grade of B, for example. Um, of course, we would need to get a bachelor's degree from an accredited college or university. And we do not require any standardized testing. I know some students are afraid of GRE or GMAT. You do not have to do that for us. Uh, we require three letters of recommendation and um, an online application form, a personal statement, of course, and the resume if you wish to submit, and a uh, transcript. We will review your application with unofficial transcripts for the sake of time, but we do ask that you provide the official ones at some point. And you also have to submit a graduate application form online, and um, $65 fee is applied to that. So we have the the deadline is approaching for the full semester. If you'd like to start in the fall, we will review applications until August 1st. And we also admit students for spring and summer start as well. And that's the beauty of the program because you can be flexible. You can start the program anytime. Um, and then December 1st is the deadline for the spring start. Pika, can we you also touch on um, what the accelerated MPH program is, and just in case we have any um, UVM current undergrad students or family members that may have uh, an undergrad, can you explain what that is, too? Sure. So accelerated Master's in Public Health is designed for the students to take two or three public health courses in their senior year. So they will have to apply by April 1st um, to start in the summer of their senior year or May 15th to start in the fall. So we will help them identify the courses that they will be taking, and those courses can be applied towards their undergraduate degree as well. They are allowed to take maximum of three public health courses or nine credits only, and then once they get their bachelor's degree from the university, they will automatically become um, master in public health students. They still have to go through the same process of applying for the graduate degree, um, and there is one extra form that they need to submit, signed by their dean's office within the college where they're um, studying right now, getting their undergraduate degree from, and everything else is the same. And I'm happy to meet with any prospective students if they have any additional questions. Great. Thank you. I think it's so important to make note of that awesome opportunity for our undergrads as well. Um, I'm not seeing any questions from our folks watching on YouTube, um, so we must just be hopefully <laughs> providing such great information today that we're answering all those questions. But 
I'm just going to give a, a shout out to our folks watching on YouTube. If you do have any questions um, related to epidemiology or global health or advising and, and the program itself, we're happy to answer those. Um, while we're giving that opportunity for any questions to come in, I wanted to maybe come back to um, Dr. Gleason real quick. What, what excites you about global health? Like, why did you choose this particular field? I think it's always interesting to see the path that someone has taken to their chosen field. That's a really great question. And I, I wish that I had a, you know, a, a really nice streamlined answer. But uh, the truth is, I always thought that I would be a physician. And uh, then I discovered epidemiology and the idea of treating communities versus treating individuals. And that really spoke to me. And I also am very passionate about living and working overseas. I spent a lot of time overseas as an undergraduate. And I thought, what better way to spend your career than blending all of those interests? And so I've been fortunate enough to be able to work internationally and apply the skills from my MPH and my doctorate in the field of global health. And a lot of it at the beginning was uh, a lot of travel internationally, a lot of living with communities, working one on one with different community leaders, which is unbelievably fulfilling and gratifying. Um, and you get to see real progress working in global health and working with communities. It's not quick. It doesn't happen overnight, but it does happen. And that's one of the best things about working in public health and working in global health in general. Great. Thank you for that perspective. And Dr. Hart, I'm going to just kind of slightly alter the question a little bit for you. Um, what, why epidemiology in terms of a prospective student? Why do you think that this is a field that is just so exciting and has so many different opportunities for our prospective students to consider. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm going to sort of piggyback a little bit on what Kelsey said about um, how rewarding it is to be in public health and a public health practitioner. Um, I came to public health from an engineering background. And to be honest, I had no idea what epidemiology was or that it was even a field when I was graduating. and and trying to figure out what I wanted to be in the world. Um, and, but I knew I really liked math, and I really liked the you know, science side of things and the quantitative side. And um, I discovered epidemiology as this amazing fit where I can apply those skills and use those skills and, and stay in a, a fairly quantitative world, but also have a really rewarding application for what I do. You know, I feel like that what we do in epidemiology and biostats is truly meaningful, and that we are impacting the health of populations, um, we're able to, to make advances even before clinical science can do so, just by, by saying, look, we're seeing this happening in this population. We're not sure why, but we can put in public health intervention in place and improve the health in our communities. And so I think when, when you ask why epidemiology, I mean, yes, it's in the forefront. You know, there's a lot of information about it out right now. But really, from a, from a passion standpoint, um, it's because you are working to improve the health of communities and having a real impact in that. Great. Thank you for that perspective as well. And, and as we had seen on some of the slides that Dr. Gleason went over, there's a lot more issues and, and broader issues that public health encompasses as well. Um, we do have a couple questions. And Vika, I'm hoping that you might be able to help us with this first one. Um, what, and I bet you get this one as well. What are the distinctions between the certificate program and the master's program? Can you walk us through that? Sure. So the Certificate of Graduate Study in Public Health is 18 credits. So you will be taking six courses um, needed for the certificate versus you do 12 in the Master's in Public Health program. We offer four certificates. One is the General Public Health Certificate. The other one is Global and Environmental Health. We also have um, certificates in Healthcare Policy and Management and Epidemiology. So all of those four certificates um, have the courses that you will have to be taking. Um, in generic public health certificate, you will be doing uh, core courses that are part of APH. All of those certificates, if you take 18 credits, can be transferred into PH if you decide to further your studies. The only thing that would, I would say um, really missing from the certificates is the comedy project experience when you don't have to complete your um, a research project with a group of students like you do in PH or applied practice experience. So it's something for the students if, you, if they'd like to enhance their knowledge in a certain field, 
or if they would like to add to the skills that they already have on their job versus getting a complete um, master's credential in public health. Great, thank you. And I know that you're always willing to chat with students if they want a little bit more information about that yeah. as well. Um, and then, Vicki, we've got some people interested in epi. Um, and so there's a question here that says, does the field of epidemiology involve lab work, for example, under the microscope or plate sampling? That's a great question. It is a great question. Um, and again, epi is so broad that I would say yes, it could, but it's probably not the most typical or normal application of epidemiology. Um, I think you know, epidemiology will certainly help with any kind of research in health and in public health. And so that could involve at some point doing some lab work. But again, it's not a typical application of epidemiology. Epidemiologists are, you know, we're part of a population health data um, understanding. And so we're often dealing with data from a lab or, you know, on a disease that other people have developed and brought to the table. And then we were able to analyze it from a population health standpoint. Um, but it's not out of the question. You know, I certainly wouldn't rule it out if that was a real interest in combining epidemiology with some kind of lab science that could definitely be done. Great. Thank you so much, and thank you for that great question. We also have a good one from Jennifer. And, and Vika, this might be directed a little bit more towards you. Um, Jennifer says, my last degree was in 1992. Is there coursework I need before entering the MPH program? Sure. We would like, we would probably like to see your transcript, Jennifer, ahead of time and recommend anything that you might need to take ahead of time. Also, we have a great opportunity for the students to get their feet wet before jumping into MPH, which means you can take up to three courses, if you like, in public health and transfer them into MPH. So you can get into the classes as a non-degree continuing and distance education student. And if you like the courses that you do well, um, then you can apply for the program and transfer those courses in. So I'll be happy to get in touch with you and um, have a look at your transcripts and provide further advising. If you can email them to us at the email provided on the slide. Great. Thank you so much. And I suspect that question comes up a lot of folks that are considering either career change or enhancing some of those skills as well. Um, this is a great question from Amy as well. Can you please share a bit about what your recent graduates are doing now for the type of work that they're doing? And, and I'll kind of toss that question out to um, any of you um, because I know you all work so closely with our students. I'm not sure if um, maybe Kelsey, or, would that be something that you could answer, start with? Uh, sure. Um, it's, it's, as you mentioned, there are so many different opportunities for students to work in after their MPH. We have a lot of students who are using their degree to switch fields. There's also a group of students who are um, mid-career professionals who are using their degree for promotion purposes. And then we have people who are fresh out of undergrad who are using their degree in order to get their very first job. And what we see time and time again, and Vika, you can probably speak to this, is our graduates of the MPH program get jobs. It's, um, I believe it's near a 100% uh, job success rate, which is really great. We have students who I know personally who work at the Vermont Department of Health or other state departments of health. I know students who are working with NGOs internationally and with different university settings as well. Pika, do you have anything? Yes, to and I can add to that. One of our recent graduates um, was working with the Vermont Air National Guard, and she got employed by the Vermont Department of Health. And one of her recent projects was um, work with the Vermont National Guard and set up the 400 overflow beds at the Champlain Valley Expo. So that was a very exciting opportunity. So she was able to do that as soon as she got the job. Um, and it's, you know, it's sad, but it's a very exciting time to be in public health. And we're certainly seeing an increased interest in the field. And I believe, uh, Dr. Hart, you may have said that you, one of your students got three job offers in the week before they even got, um, before they even graduated this spring. So there's definitely no shortage of opportunities out there. Yeah, Dr. Hart, do you want to maybe chime in? Because I think you, you also work so closely with our students. What are some areas that they've gone into that you've seen? Uh, well, yeah, like, like Vika said, I was working with a student, and she had three interviews before. Um, right in the week before graduation and, and got all three of, offers from all three of those jobs. So that was, that was really encouraging. And she's a, a great student, so I give her a lot of credit for that. Um, 
like Kelsey said, a lot of our students are mid-career, so they have work that they're doing and maybe transitioning into something new or looking for promotion. But for the students that I've worked with who are either not working and starting to work or just right out of school and looking for their very first job, um, we do see a lot at the State Department, but I've also worked with a lot of students who are working with nonprofit organizations. Um, I have a student who's working with Vermont After School, which is looking at um, what students are doing in that, that third space, so that time after school, maybe before their parents are home from work, and how we can encourage healthy activities, healthy behaviors that don't lead to problems later in life. So she's doing some good work there. We're, we're working on a biostat problem um, in her work, you know, even now. Um, so I think, yeah, it's a very broad um, array of what students are doing. I know a student who's working in the education system. Um, it really depends on what students are interested in. And I was smiling when Vika said that it's a great time to be in public health because it really, you know, sometimes it's difficult to, to keep down our excitement or my excitement about um, how much opportunity there is for public health right now, but understanding that it is on the, on the back of, of this global pandemic, which has caused a lot of havoc and tragedy within the world as well. Great, thank you so much. And, and Vicki, just keep your mic on for a sec because we know have another question. Just um, salary range, I think that's always a, a good gauge. And I suspect there's, um, Vika may point our um, prospective students to some resources as well where they could look at salary ranges. But Dr. Hart, do you have a perspective for the student as to kind of the range um, of salaries in, in epidemiology positions? Um, I don't want to put any specific numbers behind this um, because, as Kelsey said, a lot depends on the type of work that you go on to do after your degree. So if you end up working in a, a for-profit institution, it's going to be very different than academia, which is going to be very different from a nonprofit organization. What I can say is that if you Google salaries in epidemiology, there are some great websites out there that um, do give that range of salaries so that you could really see, okay, I'm interested in working in this field. What might I expect here? Um, so that's, yeah, that's as much as I'm going to say on that. Vika, do you um, point students to anything in particular to look for those kind of, uh, that kind of information? We can certainly explore some resources, depending on where the students are and what organizations or companies they're interested in. The recent number I saw was for the epidemiologist was in the range of sixty to um, eighty thousand dollars a year. Thank you. I think it's always good to try to ground yourself as to what kind of range you're even considering. Great. Thank you so much, and thank you for all the great questions. Um, it sounds like the questions are kind of slowing down, um, and so I just want to um, give an opportunity to say thank you to all of our presenters today, uh, Dr. Hart, Dr. Gleason, and Vika Blachakova. Thank you so much for being with us and answering questions from our students and showing and sharing your enthusiasm for public health. Um, this is being recorded, so I did want to share that out to our folks watching today. We will send the recording out. Um, as soon as we can, and we'll share any of these resources and links that folks have been talking about today, too. So have a wonderful afternoon. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and we hope to hear from you soon about UVM's Master of Public Health program. Have a great afternoon.